What's happening and what has happened to both journalism and PR is that the net has hit us and it's still unwinding. There's a, a recent piece in the New Yorker where the writer said that the world is being rebuilt in code, and that is in computer coding. That so far has been terrible for my business, newspapers, but it's been good for public relations because public relations has been able to take hold of the digital revolution and make it work for them. Social media allows messages, allows public relations people to put out messages everywhere all the time and to make corporations into media corporations. It's been long been a saying that all corporations are media corporations. Corporations, institutes like this one, <coughs> NGOs, trade unions, all can be media corporations and now they can really be media corporations. They put out their messages, the CEOs become famous or certainly published on Twitter and Facebook and the key function of public relations for the last hundred years for all of its existence is now uh, much more possible because of social media. Trust is now seen as very fragile. Uh, the Edelman barometer, which Ed might mention, has shown that business trust is going up a bit, trust in business. Uh, still very, very low is politics and naturally lower, together with the estate agents, is the media. Now, what Edelman argues is that, that business should take advantage of the higher trust they have in than, than politics and get into the political arena and argue their case more fully. He's also argued, indeed all public relations people argue, that trust must now be gained. Some of that can be done with clever public relations. Some of it must be done by being more trustworthy. And hence the ethical argument comes into play. Uh, some of you may be skeptical about it, but nevertheless it now seems to us to be important that that ethics in public relations is now being put up as something which must be striven for both by the agencies and by the clients. Digital has absolutely transformed everything. It's transformed the media and it's transformed public relations. The kind of structural stuff um, that's happened around digital, the emergence of new platforms, broadband, fiber optics, mobile, amazing kind of hardware. I mean, there's, I think there's uh, half of all households have got a tablet in them now, connected TVs. All of this has driven a permanent shift in consumer uh, behavior. And the fact that 60% of millennials now view social media as an important source of news. Um, not only that, talents and brands, as you make the point, uh, John, don't necessarily need the media anymore. So you've got Beyonce, who'll uh, release music straight to iTunes with no warning or any traditional kind of media publicity. Even Carl Icahn is tweeting now and driving uh, investor appetite for companies like Apple. Uh, so lots of new ways to go direct and cut out the media intermediary, if you like. The second mega trend is around data. Um, and this has been, certainly for my industry, the communications industry, an absolute kind of game changer uh, because it's no longer just about instincts. It's now about insights. Um, we're now in a place where we have a lot more confidence about the audience, what attitudes they have, what media, traditional, social they consume, and therefore we've got a much better sense of how to structure communications with them. But digital, rise in digital and this emergence of data has meant that the public interest is now being explored in a completely different way. And there's now special interest groups that are able to mobilize them, set themselves in a far more potent way than they ever have before. Influencers aren't necessarily authority figures anymore. Xbox, for example, which is a client of Edelman's, when they want to communicate directly, they go through gaming influencers. There's two young guys on YouTube that reach seven million people. Why go to the tabloid press or the mainstream press when you can reach seven million via two uh, very influential young guys? Undoubtedly, the power has shifted. Journalists are under immense pressure. A venerable print, such as The Guardian and The Wall Street Journal, both now have in-house dedicated teams of journalists who write to order in the style of their publications. Their copy is published in the usual way, but it's paid for by a sponsor, a client in PR terms. The resultant article is meant to feel similar to the editorial environment that it's published in and is flagged up quite often at the bottom of the page in not terribly large type in association with 
or sponsored by. This is known, I think you mentioned in the book, native advertising, known by many names, custom publishing, branded content, or advertorial. Its subtleties know no bounds. And it requires ever more vigilance on the part of the reader to distinguish it from newsroom copy. It's very well produced. But it's seen as a huge revenue opportunity. And as such, it's bound to grow in these days of flagging advertising. A young friend, a source of mine, who at 29 is head of communications for a major mobile network in London, says she knows of two people who wrote the entire business section of the mail for a week due to vacancies, holidays, and illness. She adds that all her contacts at this level need PRs more, not just on the stories about their clients, but on wider sector pieces. They want to know, this is a quote from her, they want to know that they can call us and we'll give them accurate information. Reduces time and the need for background. She went on to talk about consumer, which she says online is clearly much more important now. Direct to consumer has changed the most and will continue to change more, as we've heard with all the online opportunities. But, she said, getting a quality piece, front of paper in the sun, is still the holy grail and a much greater achievement than doing something on net mums. And just a very quick last word about the importance, enormous, impossible to understate, growing importance of video. We know that reporters now not only have to write their story for print, but upload video and audio, tweet, blog, and use other social media. So it's absolutely no accident that Zoella, is starring in Bob Geldof's Band-Aid 30. So Ella, for those of you who don't know her, has six million subscribers on her YouTube vlog, six million and growing, and has 26 million views per month. Vloggers, for Zoella is such, are expected to give the song much more global exposure than any other media, particularly to a teenage audience. In a quick check with my very bright first-year class, 65, 19, and 20-year-olds last week, only one hand went up when I asked who knew of Absolutely Fabulous. I thought long and hard about this, and I think the reason is that Adina and Patsy existed before social media. The millennial generation only does social. So, until PR and journalism really crack the code and know how best to use it, it will still be the consumer's choice. <laughs>